Hi, I'm Max and welcome to part two of the Building AI Agents tutorial series. In this video, we're going to look at how to set up app AI tools for our AI agents to use. I'm also going to show how you can add guardrails to that tool users so you can constrain what your AI agents can and cannot manipulate. And we'll do this all by building a Gmail draft writing assistant. So that way you can see these key concepts at play in a real use case. In part one, we covered some foundational aspects of building AI agents in NAN. So if you're watching this video, I assume you understand understand how to use NNN's chat trigger, how to add an AI agent, how to add chat models, modify its system messages, add memory and publish the workflow. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go ahead and watch part one and then come back here. Let's quickly define what an AI agent tool is, and then we'll flip to NNN and build one out. Think of an AI agent tool as a function that the AI agent can call on that helps it complete a task that it cannot do itself. Tools allow AI agents to interact with other systems, gather data, or take actions in those systems. So they make an AI agent far more capable and useful. In all of my agentic buildings so far, the biggest lever for success in your use case is the context that you can provide to your AI agent. And since tools are a real-time way to fetch context, they're super, super powerful. The nice thing is they're pretty easy to work with. Let's jump to the workflow canvas and set up an AI agent that can interact with an app through an AI tool. In part one, we focused on a chat AI agent. Let's do something a little bit different with this Gmail AI agent that's gonna write drafts for us. So the way this automation is gonna work is each time I receive a new email in Gmail, I want to ingest the contents of that email and any metadata that's associated with it. I wanna pipe that into my AI agent. I want them to generate a draft and I want to post that draft, which means the first step is I want this to run each time I'm getting a new email into my inbox. So that's the trigger that we wanna add. So since that's an app event, Let's go in on app event here and let's search for Gmail. We'll click on that and we'll add the on message receive trigger. So the first thing I'm gonna to wanna to do is create a credential. Let's create a new one real quick. The nice thing is because I'm using it in cloud right now, I can have this nice click to connect experience. So we're connected now. If you are self-hosting NNN, you are going to have to do some of the OF steps. The screen's gonna be a little bit more complicated. You can use my coupon code max50 and you can get 12 months off NNN cloud. Now that my credentials connected, let's close that. The Gmail trigger in N8N is a poll based trigger. This means under the hood, it's doing sort of a get many operation and doing the diff under the hood. So it's polling every minute for that. We could poll more or less often. Every minute sounds good. And we want this trigger to run when a message is received. So that's the correct event. If you ever see a simplified toggle in an N8N node, this controls how verbose the output data is. So some APIs can be clunky and have a lot of nested structures and stuff. So for popular nodes, N8N maintains a simplest schema for those. We do want to arm our agent with the most context possible. So we want the full raw email. So we're going to turn that off here. And what we can do to really get data in our workflow so we can build out the rest of our flow is fetch test event. So what this has done is simulated what happens when this workflow runs and it's fetched the most recent event. So this email didn't just come in, but the schema of this email, and if I flip to schema view here, the schema here will be the same when it does run. So we can use this to map downstream and build out the rest of our workflow. Now that we've got some test data in my Gmail trigger, let's actually go pin this. So I can click this pin data button here. And what this will do is persist this data, even if I clear my workflow data. And that's also true between sessions, right? So if I save this workflow, come back to it, this data will be pinned here and in the gmail api it's not as important but for some apis they're heavily rate limited or you have to pay for them that's so a great strategy when you're testing so you're not unnecessarily using your quotas so we've gotten our email so the next part that we need to do is pipe that into our ai agent so that they could write an email draft for us so let's do that let's search for our ai agent and let's add that. So the Gmail trigger is going to be sending its payload of data, this one item of data. The thing is, is it's an object with lots of unnecessary data, perhaps even personal data that we don't necessarily want to send to our LLM. In part one, you saw with a chat trigger, we're just auto feeding that data into the AI agent. In this case, what we can do is instead of using the default prompt source, we can open this drop down and click define below here. So. What I can do is using the schema view on the left here, I can actually drag and drop variables into here that we want to populate at runtime. So let's build out that user message that we want our AI agent to, to work on. So this is gonna define the actual task that we want the AI agent to do. Here, we're actually gonna combine some static text along with the, the email contents itself. So to save everyone a little bit of time, we're gonna use this pre-written message that I have here. We'll paste that in. 
Here it's saying, write a reply to the following email, then add it as a draft to the email thread. Now let's flip this to an expression. This is going to send every time this AI agent runs, every time we receive a new email. And if we collapse the headers here, let's find the actual email body here. So we have the text as HTML. So let's say we call this message. And let's drag and drop that there. So we can see it's now rendering that dynamically in here. Let's also maybe add the subject. That's probably some relevant context as well. And we probably want the from email because it's going to have their name and their email. So it's also relevant. And so we've got the from value here, but we can see Gmail supplies us with a sort of a nicer one with a bit more rich context. It's got the name and the email. And our AI agent should be able to extract that easily and pass that if it needs to. We've got from subject message that should be good to go. Now, one thing we could do since our message here has uh, HTML or could have HTML, we're going to actually wrap all this in some tags. So we're going to use pseudo XML. So let's say email. And at the end, we'll do close email. And so this creates a bit of a wrapper, some syntax for the AI agent to understand. We're saying, hey, here's the following email. And then right after that, there's also a colon. We see this very clear delineator that in here is the email. So this will help, especially if in the message, we've got some syntax or some HTML that creates structure and styling. And this way we'll have a more consistent result across. So now that we've got our user message set, let's go back to the canvas and add a chat model. In this case, let's use Claude 3.5. But again, you should be able to use any larger, more sophisticated model should work here. Since we're going to be setting up tools, some of the really small models, the 1D self-hosted models might not work. Now there's nothing we really need to tweak in here. So if you're curious on more details on chat models, do check out part one. Now that we've got a chat model and our user message, we could actually test this. So let's run it. And what we're going to see is we haven't really defined where it should create these drafts. We haven't done it explicitly. We haven't given it any tools to create the draft. All we've piped in is the context of the message and told it to write a reply. And so it's done that. It's written a reply. Right now, it's just outputting this draft, but I don't actually have a draft in my inbox yet. So let's give our AI agent the ability to create that draft on our behalf. And let's make sure that it can only create drafts. It can't delete emails, bulk search, everything else, because this use case is just for creating drafts. So let's give it exactly the permissions it needs to and nothing else. But to do that, I'll go back to the workflow canvas. And let's click this plus here to add a tool. This is going to open up the tool section of our notes panel. And since we do have an app tool for Gmail, let's click the Gmail tool to add it to our canvas. It's automatically connected to my AI agent. Let's double click on the Gmail tool to set it up. Now let's rename it first. So this is going to be create draft. And so for the first couple parameters, these are already presets. The tool description, this is the description being created by this tool for the AI agent to understand what it is. We want that to be done automatically. And then the resource that we'd like to operate on is not a message. A draft is a different entity in Gmail. So we want to operate on a draft and we want to be creating drafts. So we'll keep that to create. We're not aggregating drafts or, or deleting them or anything. So we just need this action here. And the subject line, this is one of the first parameters in this tool that we want our AI agent to decide what to populate with it. So we want to give the AI agent context. In terms of levels of abstraction, the tool description is telling the AI agent, hey, you can use this tool to create drafts in Gmail. That's essentially the information that this is going to send. And then we can decide to expose one or many of these other parameters that we want the AI to manipulate. Any that we don't explicitly expose to the AI or give it permission to modify, it won't be able to. So that's a great way that we're adding guardrails to our AI agent tools. So you're getting more predictable results in your systems. Obviously, your Gmail is not somewhere where you want an AI agent to run amok. And so to tell our AI agent that we want it to be able to manipulate the subject field, we can flip this to an expression. And in here, we'll go with open parenthesis to open up the autocomplete. And we want the from AI method. So if I hit dollar sign from AI, it'll filter by that. There is some nice inline documentation on the different arguments you need to use and especially optional ones. So let's go set that up. I'll click to add it. And the first thing it expects is a key. So this is the name of the variable from the AI's perspective. Let's call it subject. So far, when I'm building my AI agent tools, I tend to just pick the exact same parameter name that it's labeled. And then if that's not working, or it's not descriptive enough, I add on top of that. And that's definitely something I can recommend generally when you're building out your AI tools. Less is more. 
Test it with less, add more when you need to, when you identify edge cases where it's not performing uh, as you'd like. Great, so we've got this subject here. Now the email type, let's stick with a text email for now, although chat models could definitely handle uh, formatting in HTML as well. And for the message text, we're also gonna flip this to expression and also use that from AI method. So from AI. And what we want to do here is, again, give it a name, message. And here we could use some of these optional arguments. So we can define the key. So this is the name of the variable that we want our AI to inject at runtime. We can also give it a description. This is super useful if, for example, it expects some sort of ISO timestamp, we can define it there. There's also a data type that you could provide here. So if it expects a Boolean or a number, you could define that there. And you can also give it a default value. We don't really need a description in this case. And some of the stylistic things, like I want it to just be a plain text email and whatnot, we're going to place in the system message. So we've got that all in one neat source of truth inside our AI agent. Something I try to do, much like an engineer might on a project, I try to separate concerns. So this tool's job is to send a draft the how that draft is going to look, the style of it, the length, all that I like to keep in my AI agent, in my system prompts. So we're having a nice clean separation so I could duplicate this tool and use it in another use case without it having an opinionated approach on things like style. This is going to create a draft. The thing is in Gmail, someone has already sent me an email. If we go into our Gmail trigger, we can see in here that there's this thread ID. So every message in a specific email chain or an email thread is related to this ID. And since we want to create that draft as a response to someone that's already emailed me, we want the AI agent to post this reply to an existing thread, right? To an existing email. So if I'm getting this email from Ant Wilson at Superbase, hey Ant, let's definitely collaborate. I want it to post the draft here, right? Because I'm going to open up my email, be it on my phone here, see it, tweak it and send it, right? So we want to add an option here here and we want to define the thread ID. Now, the thing is each time this workflow runs, we know that in the Gmail trigger, we have the thread ID of the email that just came in. That's where we want to post the draft. That will always be the case for this scenario. So this isn't a good example where we want to give our AI agent control. Now it probably could figure it out and we could use from AI here and have our AI agent populate that. But since we don't need it to, let's constrain that. So we've got less degrees of freedom that could potentially go wrong in production, right? Because again, AI agents are not deterministic. They're probabilistic. There's a bell curve of outputs. Now with all the things that you're learning and all the tooling and prompt engineering and whatnot, you can tighten up that bell curve, but you're still going to want to use the right tool for the right job. So in this case, we're going to want to flip our input to mapping mode. Here we can see the data from my Gmail trigger and I can drag and drop that thread ID here. So now this is not something that our AI agent can control. This is pre-populated at runtime. Now that we have told the AI to populate the subject and the message and the thread ID, let's run this quickly. And I always like to run it before I'm adding a more sophisticated system prompt. So in my AI agent, if I add my system message, we can see all it's saying right now is you are a helpful assistant. There's nothing about how it should write. There's nothing about ways of working in which order it should do things. So let's run this and get a baseline. Let's test the workflow. Since we've pinned the Gmail trigger, it's gonna reuse that data and send it into our AI agent. Okay, exciting stuff. It's created the draft in there. Let's open up my AI agent. We've got an output. Great, the draft had been successfully created. Let's look in the logs. We did use the create draft tool. We got a successful response. Let's check in my Gmail. Let's refresh. Okay, we've got a draft. Dear Ant, thanks for the heads up. Da, 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 da. Okay, so some things to improve. Firstly, I don't really write like this. Secondly, I have a name. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is where the system prompt comes in, right? The system prompt is where we define the how it should complete the task, the style, the constraints. So let's add my system prompt. Now, since today is about tools and not system prompt writing, we're going to copy one in that I wrote earlier, much like in your favorite cooking show, but I will quickly voice it over so you understand what's happening in there. So let's open it up. And in the system message, let's actually flip this to an expression and open this up here. So let's replace this and let's break it down. The role, this is something I'm almost always including is a role. And again, it's prefix and a title. You are an AI assistant specialized in replying to incoming emails to Max's Gmail email inbox. 
capabilities and limitations. You cannot send emails. You can send email drafts, some stuff on tone, casual, modern, professional. The important thing here is you should sound like Max. Here are some examples of Max's voice. I took two emails from my inbox. I wrapped each one in some simple example tags. And again, you're seeing what I'm doing is I said, here are examples. And then that word is what I'm using in this tag that wraps that thing that I'm feeding in this context. So there's less ambiguity. So I've got one email where I'm excited about some thing. I'm down to collaborate. I want to do it. And then I've got one where I said, Hey, I don't really have bandwidth for that a much shorter kind of email. I only have two examples here. Now these LM models have large context windows. You could easily feed in 510 and probably get better results, but let's see how fitting in these two examples with this little bit of prompting is improving this. So let me go in here and delete this draft and let's just run this again. It ran. Let's have a quick look again here. Let's look in the logs. And let's check my Gmail real quick. Let's give this a refresh. And in here, hey, Ant, thanks for the heads up. Okay, it's shorter. It's feeling more like me. I do use PSs for sure, if you've ever received an email from me. It's got my name. I am definitely a cheerser more than a best regardser. You may have noticed that this tool allows users to create a draft. It's a single action. If you think about a lot of different things that you're going to want your AI agents to do, it's usually going to need multiple tools to get that done. Take the classic case of booking a calendar appointment in, let's say, your Google Calendar. It needs to first know your availability, so it needs to get your current events, place those to find the gaps, or maybe you have an API that can tell you where the gaps are or the availabilities are, but it has to go fetch that first. And then afterwards, it can create an event in a slot that is available. So that would require two separate tools. That's all for part two. Now we only covered app AI tools and it then has a few different types of other tools. There's the HTTP request tool that lets you interact with any arbitrary API endpoint. And you can also call another entire workflow and use that as a tool. So that lets you access all the different apps and integrations that Enidin has. Now I didn't include them in this video because those features are getting an overhaul right now. So as soon as those drop, I'll do another part going in depth on those. And I will be doing a part three of this series, but I'm not sure what to do yet. So drop a comment on what you want to see. Thanks so much for watching. I really hope you found this video valuable. If you did, part three is coming, so make sure to subscribe to catch that. This video is part of my work at the NDN studio, where I build various AI and automation projects in public. That's a wrap.